Back in the early days of the DSLR revolution, recording separate audio or double system recording was all the rage. But since then, cameras have gotten a lot better and turnaround times have gotten a lot shorter. So you might be thinking that that seems like more trouble than it's worth. And a lot of times it is. Recording fantastic on-camera audio is easier than it's ever been, and it can save you a lot of time. But there are still a lot of questions about the process from producers with smaller cameras and larger cameras, like what kind of microphone do I need? Will a lav mic work for everything, or do I need a shotgun, a pencil condenser, or a handheld mic? Will this microphone work with my camera? Where do I place the microphone, and what do I use to rig it? Those questions, and more, will be answered in this course. Hi, my name is Dave Bodie for Envato, and in this on-camera sound course, you will learn about the basics of digital audio recording, mic placement, how to get audio into your camera. You will learn about shotgun mics, lav mics, wireless systems, pencil condensers, handheld microphones, the essential accessories to make those microphones work their best, how to rig up lavaliers, how to set levels, auto gain control, limiting, monitoring in the field, and more. At the end of this course, you will know what gear you need and how to use it to record fantastic on-camera sound. To get started, check out the next lesson, where you will learn what you need to follow along. In this lesson, you will find out what you need to get started. The first thing that you're going to need is a camera with an external microphone input. Now, there are other ways to record great audio for video. You can record the audio separately. But this course is going to focus on how to get great sound, great audio for your video by recording it on the camera. So you're going to have to have a camera that's capable of accepting a microphone input. Now, that microphone input can come in a few different varieties, and that's something that we're going to explore more in an upcoming lesson. On top of that, you're going to need a microphone. Now, you don't need a specific microphone to follow along in this course, but you will need one. Now, the type of microphone that you need is going to be dependent on your setup, your camera's microphone input, the types of videos that you want to produce, and most importantly, probably your budget. So I'm going to be covering four different types of microphones that work well for video productions. Handheld microphones, shotgun microphones, lavaliers, and a basic pencil condenser microphone. But it's a good idea to know how different types of microphones work. How to use a handheld, in what situations will that work great for you? How does a shotgun microphone compare to a handheld or a pencil condenser or a lavalier microphone? And what do you need to make a shotgun microphone work properly? Those are the types of things that you're gonna be learning in the next several lessons. Now, I also wanna put on your radar the idea that you may need an external microphone preamp. What you're looking at here is a DSLR. You probably knew that. But all cameras that are about this size, so Micro Four Thirds cameras, uh, DSLRs, compact shooters that can also do photos and videos, these cameras that kind of straddle that border between photo and video, they all have a 3.5 millimeter microphone input. And the microphone preamps on these types of cameras are not spectacular. It's possible that you can find a setup that works great for you and that you can get great audio right on camera without an external microphone preamp. But I want to plant the seed so that you have the expectation that if you want to use more professional microphones, an external microphone preamp might be in the cards for you. The last thing that you're going to need to get great sounding on-camera audio is a set of headphones. Now, if you think about the picture side of things, your camera, any camera, will have some kind of monitor. It may be very small, but you have one. And that monitor is really useful for you to be able to evaluate the picture, to know if the colors are right, to know if it's exposed properly, to know, well, what it looks like. Headphones are the audio equivalent of that. Sure, you can see a levels meter, and you can see if you have sound, but without headphones, you don't know what that actually sounds like. So headphones are important. I'm going to be talking about that in more detail in an upcoming lesson. For now, you're ready to move on to the next lesson in this course, where you're going to learn about the basics of audio recording. So check that out coming up next. Before we jump into the wide world of audio gear, it might be helpful to understand how audio is actually recorded. This will help you better understand what will work for you and your setup. Audio recording starts with a microphone. A microphone is a transducer. It takes one form of energy and transforms that into another type of energy. So what types of energy are we talking about? 
Well, on the acoustic side, we have sound, right? The stuff that we can hear. Well, what is that? That is vibrations in the air. That is pressurized waves traveling through the air. The microphone's job is to take that and transform that into an electrical signal. And that's exactly what it does. Now, for the purposes of on-camera sound, I'm going to say that there are only two types of microphones. Now, there are definitely more than two types of microphones. So before you get bent out of shape, just know that when you're talking about video production, there are primarily only two different types of microphones used, dynamic microphones and condenser microphones. Now, both of these types of microphones do essentially the same thing. Like I mentioned before, they take acoustic energy, vibrations in the air, and they transform that into electrical energy. This electrical signal travels down a cable to something called a preamp. Now, the preamp's job is to amplify that electrical signal because when it comes out of the microphone, when it's generated by the microphone capsule, it's very, very small. And it's essentially useless, and it has to be amplified before it goes to the next stage of the process, which is the conversion from analog information, which is that electrical waveform, into digital bits, right? Ones and zeros. Now, when it gets to that point of analog to digital conversion, Sometimes you will have some options, depending on your camera system and the audio chips that are inside, into how the signal is converted into digital bits. The two things that you are going to have to understand about that is bit depth and sample rate. First, let's talk about sample rate. Sample rate is the amount of times per second the audio is sampled. Now, without getting into a huge technical discussion, I'm just going to give you the answer here. And the answer is 48 kilohertz. And you're thinking, I didn't ask a question, and I know that. I couldn't hear it, even if you did. But the answer is 48 kilohertz. Now, what was the question? What sample rate do I choose? You choose 48 kilohertz. Why? Number one, 48 kilohertz sounds fantastic. It's great. Are there other higher resolution audio formats out there? Yep, there are. There's 96 kilohertz. There is 192 kilohertz. Most people cannot hear the difference, especially when you consider that your video, I'm taking a chance here, is going to be consumed on a mobile device, at least by someone. It's very unlikely that your video is going to be consumed primarily by an audio file in a decked out home theater with full acoustic treatment, super high end audio system, speakers and amplifiers, right, and DACs. That's not going to be your audience, or I should say that's not going to be your primary audience because somebody probably will watch your material that has a decked out full audio suite with bananas gear, but more than likely, your media is going to be consumed on a mobile device. When you're out in the mobile world, there is noise. When there is noise, it is impossible, even for a super trained ear, to hear the difference between 48 kilohertz and 96 kilohertz or 192 kilohertz sample rate. So more, in this case, is not better. More is just more memory. Now, when it comes to audio, as it turns out, it doesn't take up a whole lot of space to begin with. So you're thinking, well, why wouldn't I just record in a super high sample rate? Put simply, you just don't need to. Your time is going to be much better spent trying to get a better signal to noise ratio, working on your mic placement techniques, working on your audio processing in post-production. Don't worry about sample rate. 48 kilohertz is fine. That's what I use. That's what lots of people use. It sounds fantastic. You can get wonderful sounding recordings and that's what you should use. So let's talk about bit depth. Now, don't be confused. This is different than bit rate, which is the amount of bits per second. Bit depth is the total number of bits of information each one of those samples can hold. And this directly corresponds to the resolution of each sample. Now, resolution in this case doesn't refer to frequency resolution, right? What's the highest and lowest kind of frequencies that we can hear? It refers to amplitude resolution. And amplitude resolution is basically signal-to-noise ratio. How much signal can you record over the noise? 16-bit audio has a maximum theoretical signal-to-noise ratio of 96 decibels, and 24-bit audio is 144. Now, those are theoretical maximums because there is noise that's generated at several points in the audio recording process. So you can't actually get to those. And you would think, well, 144 decibels is a lot louder than 96 decibels. And if we were talking about sound pressure level out in the real world, yeah, that would be true. 144 decibels would melt your face. So we're not talking about 
loudness levels here. What we're talking about is the amount of range you get over the noise. And that, unlike super high sample rates, is something that you can actually hear. So if you have the option to choose 24-bit in your camera system over 16-bit, that's the one you want to go with. The last thing to talk about is the recording codec or the audio codec. So you've converted your audio from analog to digital. You've selected the right parameters, 48 kilohertz, 24-bit. Now we need to save it. How are you going to save it? What format is it going to be? Some cameras don't have an option in how the audio is encoded. And if your camera records to something like AVC HD, H.264, H.265, HVAC, something like that, it's almost certainly going to be AAC audio. Is that terrible? No, but it is a lossy codec, meaning that it takes information, information that you can actually hear, and it throws it out the window. It gets rid of it in order to make the file size smaller. But like I said before, audio doesn't really take up a whole lot of space to begin with. So doing that, if you have the option, is unnecessary. And it's in fact bad because that's going to make things like denoising and processing your audio in post-production much more of a pain. So if you have the option between something like AAC, which is a lossy audio codec, meaning throwing out information, and a lossless codec, something like WAVE or maybe AIFF, but probably it's WAVE, and that WAVE may be actually labeled as PCM or LPCM, choose the lossless one. Now you may need to look up what your camera system calls the audio codec if you have options. It may be PCM, it may be LPCM, it may be WAVE, AIFF, whatever it is. Look it up, find out. If it says lossy codec on the wiki, choose the other one if you have a choice. If you don't have a choice, don't worry about it. In your next camera, make sure that you do have a choice. But if you have the option, you want to choose uncompressed audio. This is going to make things like post-processing and noise reduction much easier. And with that, you now know the basics of audio recording. I did talk about some more technical things. Don't let that confuse you. The two main takeaways that you need from this are the kind of general signal flow that happens, microphone, cable, preamp, analog to digital converter. You need to know those numbers, right? The answers to the question, what sample rate do I choose? 48 kilohertz. What bit depth? Do you have an option? Yes, 24 bit. Do you not have an option? No. Why are you asking the question, right? And what codec? Uncompressed or compressed? You wanna choose uncompressed. And that's really it. So now that you have an understanding of the audio recording process, you're ready to move on to the next lesson in this course, where you're gonna learn about mic placement and signal to noise ratio. Microphone placement is critical for capturing high quality audio, and it's one of the most important ideas that you will take away from this course. So what do I mean by microphone placement? Well, quite simply, it means where to place the microphone. The goal in microphone placement and in all of recording really is a high signal to noise ratio. Now, let me break that down. The signal is the thing that you want to record and the noise is the thing that you don't want to record. So let's say for a second that the signal is a human speaking, right? Microphone on a human. We want to record the human voice. What is the noise? Well, the noise is all the things that aren't that. Now, these noise sources can come from lots of different places. Environmental noise. So the space that you're in trying to record this human can generate noise, right? Uh, HVAC systems, heating and air conditioning, they can generate noise. Computers, if I'm real quiet, you may be able to hear that there's a fan in this computer and it's making a very little bit of noise. Hard drives in computers, other electronic-y type noises, some electronics hum. So lots of different places that noise can come from just within a space. You can also get people talking, music playing, traffic, uh, weather noise, right? Wind, rain, snow doesn't really make a whole lot, but you get the picture, right? Lots of different sources of environmental noise. On top of that, there's also noise that's generated in the signal processing, like we talked about before, in the recording process. Some microphones will generate a little bit of self-noise. Preamps generate noise. The analog to digital converter generates noise. All of those things are things that you don't want. On the electronic side, that noise tends to sound like kind of white noise hiss, right? 
sort of sound, but depending on how loud it is, that can be super problematic. Environmental noise may be the sort of thing where a little bit is okay, but again, that's not the thing that you're trying to record. The idea is we have the thing that we want to record and the thing that we don't. And what you want to do is get a higher ratio of the thing that you want to record, the human speaking, the signal, and a lower ratio of noise. So how do you do that? You do that by getting the microphone close to the sound source. Did your head just explode? It should have exploded. That should have been like mind blowing. It's okay if it wasn't. The idea is that microphones are not magic. Despite what they say or they claim to do, they are not magic. They all work on the principles of physics. The closer you get the microphone to a sound source, the more of that sound source will be picked up by that microphone. The more of that acoustic energy from the sound source will be transferred into that electrical energy by the microphone. So let me describe a situation here. Let's pretend that we take a microphone, doesn't matter what it is, but let's say it's this little pencil condenser, and we place this, let's say, three feet from our sound source, and we listen to what it sounds like. Now, what you're going to hear is your person speaking, and you're also going to hear the environment that they're in. No matter where they are, you're going to hear a little bit of reverberation. Reverberation is another sort of noise source, unless it's something that you want to record. We're going to say for now it's something that you don't want to record. In order to get a usable signal out of that microphone for the person speaking, you're going to have to turn up the preamplifier. You're going to have to increase the gain, if you will, on that microphone to get the voice at an acceptable level. When you do that, what else is going to be amplified? The noise. The noise will be amplified because the microphone doesn't know. The microphone doesn't listen and intelligently say, that's the thing that I want to turn up. And all this other stuff, I don't want that. Mm -mm. Everything gets turned up. So what's the solution? Well, we move the microphone closer. When you move the mic closer, the ambient noise, the environmental noise, if you will, right? People talking, music playing, wind, fan noises, right? Those stay generally the same. But because the microphone is closer to the sound source, now that sound source, from the microphone's perspective, is getting a lot more signal. So what you have to do in order to maintain the proper level is take your preamp and now turn it down to get the voice at an appropriate level. Because if it was the same level that it was at three feet away and you move it quite close to your human speaking, now it's going to be way too loud and you're going to get into clipping. That's something you don't want. So you turn it down. The effect is that now the voice is the same as it was when the microphone was three feet away. But because you turned it down and the ambient noise in the space remained the same relative to the microphone, that got turned down. So now what you've effectively done is given yourself a higher signal to noise ratio, right? Because now we have more of the voice, more of the human speaking, which is the thing that you want. And because it's closer, you now turn the preamp down. And so all of the ambient noise essentially got turned down. This is the goal for recording. This is what you want to hear. The further you get the microphone away, in addition to that environmental noise, you will be picking up more reverberation the further the microphone gets away from the sound source. Now, for now, we're saying that that's probably not what you want. If it is, then that's how you get it. But if you don't want that, you get the microphone close to the sound source. Now, another factor that plays into mic placement and getting that high signal to noise ratio is the microphone's pickup pattern, sometimes called a polar pattern. All microphones have a polar pattern that indicates how sensitive the microphone is to the sounds coming from different directions. So let's imagine for a second that you're in a dark room and there's a single light bulb hanging on a wire in the middle of the room. The light is going to radiate essentially in all directions from that light source. This is equivalent to what's called an omnidirectional pattern, which means in this example that the microphone is sensitive to sounds in all directions. Anywhere you point the microphone, it sounds more or less exactly the same. Now, if we go back to our dark room and light source scenario, and we start to make our light source more directional, if we equate that to microphones, now we are getting into unidirectional microphones, where the microphone is sensitive primarily in one direction. 
And omnidirectional and unidirectional microphones are pretty much the only microphones that you need to be concerned with. There is one other microphone type. It's a bidirectional, which records essentially in two directions, but that's not really applicable or relevant to video production. So within the realm of unidirectional microphones, you have a bunch of different shapes that determine exactly how sensitive the microphone is to frequencies in that one general direction that it is sensitive to sound. So it starts with a cardioid pickup pattern. Now cardioid is named that because it kind of looks like a fat heart. And it's most sensitive directly in front of the microphone and it rejects sounds very well from directly behind the microphone. Now if we take that cardioid pickup pattern and we make it more narrow, you get a supercardioid and more narrow still, a hypercardioid. The more narrow we start to make this pattern, they start to accept a little bit of sound from the rear of the microphone. Now I should say that these unidirectional polar patterns are sort of generalizations about these types of microphones. If you have two different supercardioid microphones, they might have slightly different pickup patterns, but in general, this is what they look like. As we narrow this pattern even further, we get something called a shotgun pattern. A shotgun microphone's pattern is very narrow in front of the microphone, has a very narrow response from the rear of the microphone, but does a fantastic job of rejecting sounds from the side of the microphone. So knowing about the polar pattern of a microphone is also important because there's an effect that can happen with the unidirectional microphones called proximity effect. The proximity effect in audio is an increase in the bass response or the low frequency response when a sound source is close to the microphone. This is good to know because if you're using these unidirectional microphones and the distance is varying a good deal, this will make the bass response be a little bit uneven and that can be problematic. This doesn't happen with omnidirectional microphones. An omni does not exhibit any proximity effect. So when you get it really, really close to the sound source, it essentially sounds exactly the same tonally as if you get it a few feet from the sound source. There is no increase in bass response. However, if you take a directional microphone and you get it super close to the sound source and then you listen to it even a foot away, there will be a big difference in the frequency response. You'll get much more bass response if it's right up near the sound source and you'll get much less when it's just a short distance away. So knowing about signal to noise ratio helps you to understand that you need to get the microphone close to the sound source. And knowing about the polar patterns helps you to understand how to orient the microphone so that the microphone is picking up the sound that you want it to pick up. So now that you have an understanding of mic placement, signal to noise ratio, and polar patterns, you're ready to move on to the next lesson in this course, where you're gonna learn how to get the audio from the microphone into your camera. Question. Will this microphone work with this camera? How about these two? In order to use these devices, you have to know how to connect them properly. And in this lesson, you'll find out how. When you're talking about cameras and microphone inputs, the good news is that there are not a lot of options. You basically only have to keep track of two. Like I mentioned earlier, smaller cameras, compact cameras, DSLRs, Micro Four Thirds, little small point and shooters with microphone inputs are probably going to have a 3.5 millimeter microphone input, while larger cameras with a little bit more real estate to work with are going to have an XLR input. An XLR connector is a professional connector. Three pins in a metal housing, it's very rugged, it's robust, it's meant to take a lot of abuse, thousands and thousands of connects and disconnects. It's a balanced input. It more than likely gives you access to phantom power, which helps you power microphones. And it gives you access to the vast majority of microphones that are out there in the world. A 3.5 millimeter microphone input is an unbalanced microphone input. It does supply, in many cases, a very, very small amount of power to power a lavalier microphone. And it's not as robust or rugged. And like I mentioned earlier, the preamp inside cameras that are smaller don't tend to be as high performance as cameras that come with XLR inputs. That's not to say that cameras that have XLR inputs have great preamps, but if you were going to compare all of the cameras that have XLR inputs versus all the cameras that have 3.5 millimeter microphone inputs, they're not as good. Again, that doesn't mean you can't get great sound 
with a small camera with a 3.5 millimeter microphone input, it just means that your options are a little bit more limited. So you heard me mention in the comparison balanced versus unbalanced. What does that mean? Unbalanced wiring uses just two connections. You have the signal and then you have ground. And this is much more susceptible to external noise sources. And this limits your ability to do longer cables. With balanced wiring, you get three connections. You get the signal positive, then you get another copy of the signal, which is inverted, which is the signal negative, and you get the ground. So why is that a big deal? You have a positive signal and a negative signal, or it's basically an inverted signal. When that balanced signal reaches its destination, the negative side or the inverted side gets flipped. And so any noise that was present in the line is now out of phase with itself and cancels itself out. Right? If you have two waves that are 180 degrees out of phase and you put them together, you sum them together, if they're exactly the same, they will cancel each other out. And so balance connections along with their twisting and their shielding do a much better job of rejecting noise. And you can have a cable length of 50 or even 100 feet or more without a problem. And on the unbalanced side, that is a problem and that's not going to work out. And like I said before, it doesn't mean that you can't get great sound or if you use a microphone input that has a 3.5 millimeter connection, that it's going to be noisy. It might be, but it probably won't be as long as you keep your cable lengths relatively short. If you're not going to use an external microphone preamp with a 3.5 millimeter microphone input, it does limit your options in the types of microphones that work well. You can use a wireless lavalier that has an unbalanced output. You can use a wired lavalier as long as the cable length is relatively short. And you can use a small shotgun microphone with a built-in power supply, again, as long as the cable length is not too long. Now, the issue with cable length is a little bit of a variable because what might work in one location may not work in another location with more electromagnetic interference. It's the type of thing that you run the risk of when you use unbalanced cables. You may have a, a line that's six feet long that works fine 80% of the time. And then you get to a certain location and it's wired in such a way that's outputting some radio frequency and then you get noise on the line. That is the benefit of using an XLR system with professional microphones. That sort of thing almost never happens. Now you can use professional microphones with your camera system that has that 3.5 millimeter input you just need an external microphone preamp. Now, that's gonna be an additional cost, and to get really good preamps, that's gonna cost a fair bit of money. You might be looking at between $250 to $400 USD. You're asking this device to take that balanced signal and then give you an unbalanced signal, but you're also asking it to amplify the microphones and do it without a lot of noise, and that's the thing that can cost a little bit of money. You're also probably going to want phantom power in that device as well. Now, what is phantom power? Phantom power is a little bit of voltage that's transmitted from the camera or from the preamp, more specifically, on the microphone cable to power the electronics of condenser microphones. You'll learn more about this in an upcoming lesson, but condenser microphones require power to operate. Some of them have inbuilt batteries, but almost always, if you give them phantom power, they have better performance. So, in general, it's much better to use phantom power if you have it. Another thing to note with the 3.5 millimeter input is whether it's a stereo or a mono input. Now, to my knowledge, most of the microphone inputs that I've seen, the 3.5 millimeter variety, are stereo. This type of connector looks exactly the same as what you might see on a standard pair of earbuds, not earbuds with a microphone, just regular, like your dad's earbuds or something, right? It's TRS, so it's got three connections on that little connector there. It has a tip, it has a ring, and a sleeve. And so for a stereo microphone input, that's going to be left, right, and then ground. If it's mono, it's just going to be signal and ground. There's no right or left, it's just signal and ground. So that's going to be useful to know if you're, let's say, trying to pick out a lavalier microphone to plug directly into your camera, not going into an external microphone preamp, you're going to need to know, well, do I need a stereo microphone input? Do I need one microphone to send the signal on both the right and the left? Do I actually need two different microphones? And how do I do that? Do I need an adapter? That's something that you're going to have to sort out because it may not work to plug a mono microphone 
into a stereo microphone input or do the reverse, plug a stereo microphone into a mono microphone input. It may not work at all. It may be causing damage to the microphone input because you're shorting the positive and the ground together. That is probably not a good thing to do. So it's good to know you're going to want to look in the manual and find out exactly how that works. Like I said before, I'm reasonably sure all the cameras that I've ever seen with a 3.5 millimeter input, it's a stereo input. But if it were me, I would want to double check. If you are using a camera with XLR inputs, the world is your oyster. You can use practically any microphone out there with no trouble. You don't have to use batteries in your microphone because I'm guessing that your camera will supply phantom power and you are set. You're probably going to have good preamps and you're good to go. So whichever microphone input system you may have, you can get good results, but depending on your goals and what you want to be able to use, it may require some more adapters or an external microphone preamp if you're on the 3.5 millimeter side of things. If you're on the XLR side of things, you have a ton of options. Coming up in the next chapter in this course, you're going to learn about several different types of microphones. And it starts with a shotgun microphone. If I had to choose one desert island microphone for video production, it would be a shotgun microphone. Is it the best at everything? No, but compared to a lavalier, a pencil condenser, or a handheld microphone, it wins in many more situations. And in this lesson, you'll find out why. These microphones are easily identifiable because they are long and skinny. And you will see these little slits cut into the side. And this gives you an indication of how they work. Now, like I mentioned earlier, a shotgun microphone is a very, very directional microphone. So it accepts sounds from a very narrow angle from the front of the microphone and does a fantastic job rejecting sounds that come from the sides of the microphone. Now, some will have a small acceptance angle in the rear of the microphone, but again, that depends on the particular microphone. A shotgun microphone works because of these slits in the sides. Sounds arriving from what you might call off axis, meaning not directly in front of the microphone, come in like this. And because there are slits on both sides, they tend to cancel each other out. And so you get most of the sound pickup coming from directly in front of the microphone. Now, if you look around on the interwebs, you'll see shotgun microphones in a wide variety of lengths. Now, the thing that makes shotgun microphones work is, in fact, their length. The longer the shotgun microphone is, the more of these kind of side ports you will get and the more directional it will become. This is probably the shortest length that I would consider in the shotgun microphone family. Technically, I think Sennheiser actually calls this a super cardioid, but in my experience, it acts much more like a shotgun microphone than other super cardioid microphones that I've used. And as these microphones get longer, the acceptance angle in the front of where they are most sensitive to sound narrows quite a bit. So this is about 12 inches long, and you can find shotgun microphones as long as 21, even 22 inches. So they can get really long. You can get some of these longer shotgun microphones four, five, six feet away from their intended target and still get really good pickup. But just like with all microphones, you have to pick the right microphone that will work well for you. And I picked this one. This is the Sennheiser K6 slash ME66. That's a really kind of odd name there. This is a microphone system. The K6 is the power module, and this is the actual microphone itself right here. The microphone element is right about here. And so this is the thing that powers it. And with just this piece right here, it's, it's useless. But Sennheiser makes different uh, capsules for this uh, K6 system right here. They make an ME67. This is the ME66. The 67 is a little bit longer. And because it's longer, it has a more narrow uh, pickup pattern on the front. They also make some other microphones. They make a handheld um, and an Omni. The reason why I chose this microphone is because it has a really high output compared to a lot of other shotgun microphones. Meaning that if you had two microphones, and one had a higher output and one had a lower output, given the same sound source at the same distance, this microphone will output more voltage, which means you have to turn up the preamp less. And at the time when I bought this microphone, I was using an external 
recorder to record my audio, and the preamps were not super great. So I wanted a microphone with a much juicier output. Now the camera that I'm using has fantastic preamps, and I have to turn them like on two and a half out of 10. Now a shotgun microphone is used generally off camera. So you'd position this right out of frame and point it directly at my mouth if this were, uh, you know, if I was just recording one person. Because if I was just to kick this a little bit sideways, it would still pick up my voice, but a lot of the high frequencies would be attenuated pretty severely. It's usually positioned above the subject and pointing down because the things that you want to cancel are generally emanating from uh, kind of a horizontal plane. And the thing that you want to capture is coming from underneath. And so it makes sense to point it like this. So because of how these are used, they need to be positioned kind of up and out of frame. They will often need some additional gear to make these work. You usually will need some kind of stand. Sometimes you can get away with using just a regular microphone boom stand, but more often than not, you will need a boom pull, something that has some serious reach, maybe six, 10, 12 feet or more. Now that boom pole can be operated by a human, a boom pole operator. You can stand there and hold that in kind of a field production where things are moving around. Or if you're in a more static situation, you can put that boom pole on a C-stand with a boom pole hanger or some other device to hold it securely. The reason why I call this my desert island microphone is because it works in a lot of different situations really well. A single microphone works great for a single person, but what if you had two people? You can use this microphone for two people as well. If you have a boom pole operator who can kind of Hollywood the microphone, get it pointed back and forth between the two people speaking, it can work great for that. Or if you're in an interview situation and the two people are pretty close together, you can get the shotgun microphone position just so, so that it's kind of in the middle and picking up both people in the interview uh, fairly evenly. Something that you can't do with like a single lavalier microphone. The other thing that's perhaps not as well known is shotgun microphones make fantastic voiceover microphones. Remember what I said before about proximity effect? Now that proximity effect is not something that turns my voice into like a radio announcer, but it does beef up my voice a fairly good amount. And because it does a great job at noise rejection, any little extraneous noises that may be happening in my studio get drastically reduced with this type of microphone. It's not the typical voiceover type of microphone that you'll see when you look on the forums at what's the best voiceover microphone. But having tested many, many microphones over the years, these work really well for that. There's no other microphone that you can say the same thing for, which is why I love the shotgun microphone. So I thought it might be good if you heard what that shotgun microphone actually sounded like in comparison to this lavalier. Now this lavalier is an Omni, it's mounted to my chest right here. And the shotgun microphone is mounted right here. In fact, I could probably just pull it down just a little bit. It's just probably a few inches off frame. And so I'll cut over to that now. And so now you're hearing the shotgun microphone. The levels are set on the camera pretty similarly. This is a little bit hotter than the lavalier microphone, but it's as close as I could get it. And so the sound should sound pretty good because it's pretty close. I mean, right now, the shotgun is maybe 14, 15 inches away from my mouth. If I get it further away, you're gonna to start to get some of that room sound in there, but I have probably a little bit that I can move this microphone away and still have it sound nice and focused. So I just moved the shotgun microphone up another, I don't know, 14 inches. So now it's probably in the neighborhood of two and a half feet away from my face. And it's aimed as close as I can get it to my mouth here. And it still should sound pretty good because of that nice directionality. Now, shotgun microphones can get super pricey, but decent shotgun microphones, uh, the XLR variety, probably are going to start around the $200 range and go up from there. This microphone was $460, and I would say that the law of diminishing returns is right around that area, around five, $600, you're not gonna find a better microphone. I think this is one of the best microphones out there for sound quality, build quality, uh, sound output. It's got one of the hottest uh, outputs out there and I have looked at almost every shotgun microphone made. But again, if your camera has decent preamps, you don't need a super hot microphone and so you can get away with something that has perhaps half as much output as this microphone may have. If you're looking at XLR microphones, you wanna be looking at companies like Sennheiser, Audio-Technica, 
Rode. Even Shure Microphones has, in the last few years, released a few shotgun microphones. My favorite is probably Sennheiser, Audio-Technica, and Rode. You're going to have to find the microphone that works best for you. But remember, longer is more directional, and you are going to need an XLR input for these types of microphones. Now, what about the little tiny shotgun microphones, like the Rode VideoMic, the Rode VideoMic Pro, the Sennheiser little tiny on-camera shotgun microphones? They are more directional than a cardioid or a super cardioid, but they don't have the same directionality as a microphone that's a foot long or 16 inches long or 27 inches long. It's just impossible. Can you get good results with them? Yes. Are they as directional as a microphone like this? No, they are not. But if you are using a camera system with a three and a half millimeter microphone input, that may be something that you want to explore. A lot of the pictures you will see of those microphones are on camera. On camera microphones, like you might imagine, do not work great for mic placement because the microphone is not close to the sound source. But with a little boom pole, a little extension cable, those microphones can work really well for getting great sound for cameras with a three and a half millimeter microphone input. So now that you understand why the shotgun microphone is so great, you're ready to move on to the next lesson in this course, where you're gonna learn about the essential gear that you might need for your shotgun. Unlike a lavalier mic, a shotgun needs a little bit more kit to make it work properly. In this lesson, you'll learn about stands, windscreens, shock mounts, and more. The first thing to talk about is the mic clip. Now, more than likely, your microphone came with a mic clip. If that microphone is going to be on a boom pole that someone is moving, you probably are going to want to use something more like this. This is a shock mount. It's a little microphone holder with some rubber bands that isolate the microphone from rumbles that can be generated in the boom pole. And so if they're in a regular mic clip like this, and it's on a boom pole, you can pick up the faintest movements in the boom pole. Sometimes you can even pick up fingers moving on the boom pole or cable noise. So to help isolate that, a very basic shock mount is all you need. And this is very, very basic. I think this shock mount cost maybe $12 USD on amazon.com. You can certainly find more fancy mounts, but I find this perfectly adequate to hold there's no chance that this thing is coming out, and it does a great job. I mean, that didn't even slip at all. So what do you attach that mic clip to? At the very basic level, you can get away with something like this, if it's in the right situation. This is a standard microphone boom stand. It's very common to see on stage and in the recording studio. This is a chrome model here, and I picked that to uh, stand out against the black background there. This is not ideal for the shotgun microphone because the shotgun microphone is, is pretty long. And so you do have to get this up pretty high and it, it works in some situations. I wanted to mention it because I've used it several times perfectly well, and you can find these fairly inexpensively on Craigslist or at your local music store. So it is an option. Not super flexible, but I did want to make you aware of it. The ideal setup for a shotgun microphone is a boom pole, like this guy right here. And this will allow you to get the microphone way out there. This is not fully extended, but this goes uh, about 10 feet uh, when it's fully extended, maybe a little bit more. You can find boom poles in lengths of, I would say, probably around 5 feet to over 10 feet, perhaps as much as 12 feet, and in multiple sections. So this has one, two, three, four, five sections, and you may find, uh, like a slightly longer one may have four sections, but it, it may be longer uh, when it's fully collapsed. So this boom pole is made out of aluminum, and aluminum is probably the most inexpensive boom pole material out there. This pole only cost about $150. And you may be thinking, $150 for a stick is quite expensive. And I suppose it is, but um, it does work very well. It's lightweight, it collapses down. There's plenty of DIY solutions out there where you can order an adapter for a painter's pole and get a painter's pole that goes out 10 feet. Now, it won't be 
as compact when collapsed, but you can get that painter's pull for like maybe $30 and an adapter for maybe $10 or $15 and have the same sort of reach for a heck of a lot less dough. Now, as you move up in price, you get into materials like fiberglass and carbon fiber, and the main advantage with those is weight. Now, you will see some boom poles have an internal cable and some do not. Now, an internal cable is gonna add to the cost. If you're doing a lot of run and gun stuff, setting up super, super fast, tearing down, running from place to place, you're constantly on the move, an internal cable is probably the way to go. So, how do you suspend a boom pole like this? Well, you use something like this. This is a boom pole hanger. Actually, I take that back. This is not a boom pole hanger. This is a fish pole hanger that I bought at Walmart for $10. This is a boom pole hanger. Do you see any similarities? This is a very crude device, but it's very effective. The boom pole just kind of sits in here, just like this. Now, when there's a weight on the other end, it's held down just like this. Usually you put the, the heavy end here so it sits on the hook, and it's that's pretty much all there is to it. I already have this little tilt bracket here that used to go to a light and attaches to a 5 8 uh, stud on the top of a light stand. So I just drilled it out and attached this boom pole holder or fish pole holder. It's not really a boom pole holder, but it's the same thing. And uh, I got this thing to work uh, very easily. More traditionally, uh, what is used is a boom pole holder and a grip head. Now there are more fancy boom pole holders out there that cost much more, but this sort of deal with a boom pole holder and a grip head has been used for many, many, many tens of years. It works just fine. Now, what do you attach your boom pole holder and grip head to? Traditionally, you use a beefy stand, something like a C stand. You can get away with a more lightweight light stand, perhaps an aluminum light stand, but I do wanna caution you that you wanna make sure it's sturdy. You wanna make sure that even with a C stand, there is adequate uh, weight on the stand in the form of sandbags. I wouldn't put a boom pole and a grip head and a boom pole holder on like a $14 stand that I got on eBay. I'd wanna make sure that it was a beefy stand, something that could actually take a little bit of stress and kind of torque, because when that thing is up there, you know, eight or 10 feet in the air and then boomed out eight feet, there's a pretty good amount of stress that's put on the stand. So not an area to go super thrifty. I usually put mine on a C stand. Sometimes I'll put it on a beefier aluminum kind of light stand, more of a traditional light stand. The last major accessory category to talk about with shotgun microphones is wind protection. This is a windscreen and it came with my microphone and it slips right on the end and this does something. I can't tell you exactly what it does. It's not fantastic, but it's better than nothing. Shotgun microphones are pretty sensitive to wind noise. So sensitive that when I use this for a voiceover microphone, I put this windscreen on it. So even inside, I put this windscreen on. It doesn't affect the sound too drastically. A lot of times, if the microphone is gonna be used by uh, someone who's not me, and I'm worried about it getting banged around, I'll throw the windscreen on it, at least this one, so that it just protects it against shocks. You know, someone drops this. If they drop it without the windscreen on, serious damage could occur, especially if it's a hard floor. With the windscreen on, has a much higher chance of surviving the fall. But primarily, windscreens are used uh, to protect the microphone from uh, wind. This outside, uh, I would say it's mostly useless, except in the very lightest of breezes. Outside, you are going to want much more substantial wind protection. Now, you can get a kind of furry version of this. There's a company called Movo, and they make kind of a version of this. It's got a, a less dense foam on the inside in a rubber gasket and a big kind of furry covering to the outside. And, and they make this sort of slip-on windscreen um, with a dead cat sort of thing on the outside that does a much better job of reducing wind. I've used that outside, and it works really, really well. The ultimate in wind protection for a shotgun microphone, and really anything, but uh, these are primarily used with shotgun microphones, is this right here. This is a blimp with what's usually referred to as a dead cat 
on the outside. This is not a real dead cat. It's a dead bear. I'm just kidding. It's not a dead bear. This, in fact, is a homemade blimp. Uh, and the reason why it's homemade is because, like I mentioned before, I am a pretty thrifty person, but I'm also pretty crafty. And the main idea with a blimp is to give the microphone a lot of protection and shock mounting against a wind. So this actually has two layers of wind protection. This outer section here, this fur, on any blimp, does the job of reducing most of the energy of the wind. Most of the wind speed is killed uh, with this fur right here. And then on the inside, I have another layer of uh, wind protection. And then there's a cage here, and this is the same that you'll find in a commercial unit. And inside the cage, there is a shock mount. Now this is a, a real fancy shock mount, and mine, it's a bunch of rubber bands. It works fantastic. Now, the main reason why I built this is because a commercial blimp, something by Rode and many of the other manufacturers, would run between $300 and $350. And I built this, in fact, I built two of these for about $40. If you want the best wind protection out there, it's going to be in the form of a blimp. So now that you understand all the different things that you may need to get your shotgun microphone to work for you, you're ready to move on to the next lesson in this course, where you're going to learn about lavalier microphones. A lavalier microphone is a must-have tool for the solo producer. In this lesson, you will learn why it's essential and how to choose one for your system. The lavalier microphone, also known as a lav mic, lapel mic, body mic is a miniature microphone used for television theater and public speaking applications in order to allow for hands-free operation. So what makes a lavalier microphone so special? Well, the primary reason is that it gets mounted to a person and that's close to the sound source. So getting very good clear sound and a good signal to noise ratio is pretty easy with one of these because you can get it so close to the sound source. Now, all lavalier microphones are pretty small, although you can get lavalier microphones that are super, super small. And then you'll see older lavalier microphones that, by modern comparisons, are quite large. Nearly all lavalier microphones are condenser microphones. There are one or two commercially available dynamic lavalier microphones, but these, for all intents and purposes, are worthless. These little condenser microphones work like a capacitor, and so they need a little bit of a charge to work properly. This means that the microphones that you see out there that plug directly into a smaller form factor camera with a three and a half millimeter or one eighth inch jack is getting power from the camera. Now this is not phantom power, this is just a little bit of bias voltage, and all of those cameras will supply that. So most of the lavaliers that you will see out there are omnidirectional, meaning that they pick up sound in all directions, or they're sensitive to sounds in all directions. And this is very, very good. This is what you want. You will see some cardioid microphones out there, but in general, it's best to use an omnidirectional microphone unless there is some special circumstance. A cardioid microphone might be good in a situation where there was perhaps more ambient noise, but placement of a cardioid microphone, because it's so close, is going to be a lot more tricky. You're going to get proximity effect, and if the person is moving around, if they're moving their head from side to side, you're going to get more variance in frequency response, because when they're turning away from the microphone, now that microphone is picking up the sound from the person's mouth off axis. And when it's off axis, it's not picking up all of those nice high frequencies as well. So it's usually best to go with an omnidirectional microphone. So you most commonly see these microphones used kind of pinned or clipped to the chest, kind of in this region right here. Outside of this region right here, the sound becomes pretty undesirable. You're going to get more ambient noise. You're probably going to get a little bit more fabric noise or just general unwanted noise. So these mics can be used clipped to the outside of clothing, like you see this microphone right here. And they can also be hidden under various items of clothing. Now, when you're trying to hide the microphone, the size of the microphone capsule or the element on the end of the wire is a little bit more critical to getting a good hide and making sure that it's working properly. Some of the larger lavalier microphones just don't hide very well underneath clothes because you can see the bump underneath, say, a tight-fitting shirt. 
So let's talk about some options here. If you have a smaller form factor camera with a three and a half millimeter or one eighth inch input, you can find some really nice, and I would even venture to say some great sounding options really inexpensively. The reason is because a lavalier microphone is incredibly simple. The microphone capsule itself is incredibly inexpensive. You can find really high quality, tiny microphone capsules for less than a dollar online. Then you have a cable or a wire, and then you have some kind of termination jack, which is the end that you plug into your camera. So they are really, really simple. So you can find great options to plug directly into your camera for as little as, I would say, $30. You can find some really high quality microphones. Now, the results that you'll get with those less expensive microphones and really any microphones that you plug into those smaller form factor cameras have a lot to do with the audio performance of your camera, the bias voltage, the preamp performance, because not all cameras will provide the same amount of voltage. Not all cameras have the same preamp performance, so there will be some variability there. But if you check out mics from Giant Squid Audio, Aperture Audio, JK Mic, you'll find some really fantastic options for not much more than $30 to $50 USD. If your setup is pretty simple and you are pretty close to your camera using a wide angle lens, you can get away with using these microphones with maybe even a short extension cable, and you should be pretty safe. If you're trying to extend the microphone's cable maybe upwards of 20 feet, you could run into some interference problems. So, it's not to say that it won't work, but you should be aware that it's not really the best solution. The one thing that I do want to make you aware of is that there are several microphones designed for mobile phones, and they do have a three and a half millimeter or one eighth inch connector on them, but they're not the same and they won't work in your camera. The type of microphones that are designed for mobile phones have a TRRS connector. The microphone that you're looking for is still three and a half millimeter, but it's going to be either TRS or TS. So let's talk about your options in XLR lavalier microphones. A ton of great options out there. You will notice right off the bat that they are all much more expensive than the basic microphones that you can get for a smaller form factor camera. This is because the mics that you get for the smaller form factor cameras don't have any circuitry in them at all. It's just a mic, a cable, and a little connector. But an XLR lav will have an integrated circuit that does a little microphone preamplification and takes the phantom power and reduces that to the exact right voltage for that particular microphone element. These are sometimes called a power module. Sometimes they are modular, meaning you can get the power module separate and you can swap different microphones in for it. Sometimes it's a hard wire right to the microphone, but all of the XLR lavalier microphones will have this, and that's what contributes to them being more expensive. Now, that being said, you can find some relatively inexpensive XLR lavalier microphones from companies like MXL and Movo. Moving up a little bit in price, you get microphones like the Shure SM93, the Audio-Technica AT899, which is the microphone that I'm using right here, the Sanken COS 11D, and several other great microphones from Rode, Sennheiser, Countryman, and DPA. One thing that you won't find in any of the specifications is any mention of cable noise. Lavalier microphone cables can make noise when the user is moving around. Now, the amount of noise that is generated has to do with how the microphone capsule is assembled and the material that the microphone cable is made out of. Some microphones are incredible and you can move around a whole lot and not hear any cable noise. And other microphones are really terrible and you move around just the slightest bit and you can hear shh, 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 shh. you can hear the microphone rubbing on the clothes even though there's not much movement so that's something to be aware of i have a sense that microphone cables that have more of a shiny or glossy finish on them tend to be quieter because they slip past clothing more easily and microphone cables that are a little bit rubbery or have a really matte finish tend to make a little bit more noise in general, this may not be the case for all microphones, because they tend to stick and they have more friction against the clothes. So cable noise is just something to know about. It is there, it's not something that's listed in the specs, but it could be problematic, so it's good to find a vendor that has a good return policy, so if you don't like the way the microphone is performing, you can return it, swap it out for something different. Lastly, let's talk about wireless microphones. I think there is a common perception that when you talk about lavalier microphones, 
people sometimes assume that you're talking about a wireless microphone, and this isn't the case. It's my personal view that if you don't need a wireless microphone, you should not use a wireless microphone if you have the option. Now, it could be that you can only afford maybe one microphone and you wanna get a wireless microphone so you have that option, and that's totally fine. But if you're in this type of situation where you're in a controlled environment, you're not doing a lot of moving around, it's kind of a lot more sit down type of interview stuff, I would recommend going with an XLR or hardwired microphone because there are a lot less issues involved with that. In fact, there's hardly any issues. You don't have to deal with batteries in the transmitter or the receiver. You don't have to deal with potential interference issues. And a hardwired microphone is less expensive, always. But if you need to go wireless, I'm totally okay with it. You can find systems that work with XLR and three and a half millimeter microphone inputs, although I think you'll probably find more of them are in the XLR camp, but there are still quite a few available for three and a half millimeter microphone inputs. And because most smaller form factor cameras do have a stereo microphone input, you can use two wireless units with your camera, but you will need a cable to sort that out because you can't just plug two wires into one input. You're going to need some kind of adapter cable to split that input into two separate inputs. The one caveat to wireless systems is they are not cheap, especially when you look at really high performing, very reliable units. If you look at wireless systems from Shure, Sony, Sennheiser, Rode, Audio-Technica, higher quality systems will start around $350 and usually the range over the years has been right around $300 to $500 for a super reliable, high quality system. So now that you understand the basics about lavalier microphones, you're ready to learn about the accessories that you can use for lavaliers to help mount them and to protect against wind and clothing noise. And that's coming up next. Just like shotguns, there are a bunch of useful accessories that help lav mics to perform their best. In this lesson, you will learn about the essentials to keep in your kit. So let's look at some of the accessories that came with this microphone right here. This is the Audio-Technica 899CW, and there are a few different versions of this microphone. This particular one is the one that's sold and designed to go with the Audio-Technica wireless transmitters. There's another version available that costs about $100 more that comes with an XLR power module. The cool thing about this microphone is that it comes with a bunch of really nice accessories. It's got a great little accessory package. And the accessories that the microphone comes with can be an important thing when you're choosing your microphone. You'll see some microphones just come with a real basic clip and maybe a windscreen, and that's about it. And other microphones come with a pretty healthy accessory package. So that's something to consider when you're looking at the price of a lavalier, something that I didn't mention before. To start with, let's look at the microphone clip. Not all microphone clips are the same, and this is a, a nice metal clip. It's got a really stout spring. It even comes with a little kind of nylon or rubber boot here that you can slide over this little alligator part here to protect the teeth if you were clipping this on some more delicate fabric, or if you wanted some more bite, you can take that off of there. But even the clip itself is kind of a nice design. There's this little extra cable clamp over here so that you can get the mic kind of oriented in the right way. And the actual microphone mount on this clip is modular. So it actually comes off and you can swap this out for some different variations. For example, there is this microphone mount, which is kind of a double microphone mount. You can see this guy right here is a single and this is a double mic mount. And you can actually use this to mount two microphones. That's sometimes done uh, when you need some redundancy. Or you can use this mount to route the cable differently. So you can um, mount the microphone here and then have the cable wrap over to this side if that's what you needed. So it comes with some different options here and that is very handy. One of the other nice things about this microphone mounting system is that you can actually use this microphone mount here in something like a shirt button or something. It's just the right size to fit into like a standard shirt button opening and with a little tape on the back, you can make that work pretty well for a nice low profile microphone mount. This microphone also comes with an element cover. So this is a protective cover that's designed to go over the end of the microphone to protect the microphone element. 
and you can see there's a there's a mesh here and so that will protect it against moisture dirt and dust and makeup unlike some other microphones this is not designed to affect the overall frequency response or the sensitivity of the microphone. Some other microphone makers like Countryman will come with different interchangeable caps to the end of the microphone element and that drastically changes the frequency response. Like most microphones, this microphone came with a real basic windscreen and that's what you're looking at here. You don't have to buy the specific windscreen that goes with your microphone. Although some microphones are a specific shape like the Tram TR50, the Shure SM93. They're more of kind of a square or rectangle shape. And so some of the smaller windscreens, like this windscreen right here, wouldn't really fit on one of those microphones because of the rectangular shape. But most of the lavalier microphones that you'll see out there are in fact round. So you can find a bunch of third-party windscreens out there. Now, speaking of wind, you can get a better windscreen in the form of something like this. This is a little furry here from Ryko. And this is kind of a system where it comes with these kind of larger windscreens here. And depending on the size of the microphone element, you can fit this inside or around the microphone first and then try and get this furry over top of it. Uh, if you have a larger microphone element, you can just fit that probably directly on the windscreen. Although I would probably want to attach one of the protective covers for this particular element just to make sure that none of these little bits of foam got in there or you know this was protected against kind of the loose hairs. If you're going to mount the microphone outside of all of your clothing and you're going to be actually outside, if there's any kind of wind, this is the kind of protection that you want here, some kind of thing with fur on it. And Ryko is not the only manufacturer of these. They're perhaps one of the more well-known, but if you look around there on different sites, b &H Photo and Amazon, you'll find other makers of similar devices here that offer nice wind protection for lavaliers that have this kind of furry vibe. There are a few more mic mounting options that are pretty interesting that I wanted to show you. One of them is this magnet arrangement here. This is a two-part system where you put this little metal disc here under the clothes and you can attach there's a little spot right here where you can attach a lanyard. And so you can put this under the clothes and then this microphone mount snaps right to it and you can mount the microphone there. This can be really helpful for pieces of clothing where you can't clip the microphone. So perhaps on a t-shirt, if you couldn't get the microphone rigged and clipped just under the neck, if you wanted to mount it more in the center of the chest on like a t-shirt or something, something like this might be really helpful where you didn't have to bunch up the fabric to get a clip kind of in the middle of the chest area. And also on different types of fabric, it can be really obtrusive to clip the microphone. So something like this can come in really handy. And it does a great job of holding the microphone. This is another type of pretty common microphone lavalier mount. This is a Viper, or sometimes called a vampire mount. Basically, there's this little rectangle of plastic or metal, and then attached to it are two little pins. And the idea here is you can take this with some fabric, and you can basically just slide it like this, and basically it just sort of pins right to the shirt. Now this will poke holes in whatever clothes that you are attaching this to. I mean, that's sort of the point. So that's something to be aware of, but this is another very secure lavalier mounting method here that can work on different types of clothing when a mic clip just won't work. Even if you're just using the basic mic clip for a lavalier microphone, Usually you'll use one piece to make a little loop to act as a strain relief, kind of uh, further down, maybe in the torso region. I like to use another piece of tape somewhere close to where I'm mounting the microphone to just help hold the wire up and, and get it pinned down underneath the shirt so it's not as visible and it's not kind of moving around and altering my placement of the microphone. So a little bit of gaff tape is really great for that. And there's also several other ways that you can use gaff tape to mount microphones under clothes. You can make a little DIY triangle mount and that works very well. And it's real handy stuff to have when you're working with lavalier microphones. So some basic gaff tape is a definite must. This is double-sided sticky tape. Also very, very handy to have when you are rigging lavalier microphones. You can use it to help minimize clothing noise, to tape kind of clothes to body. You can create a basic microphone mount by taking a little bit of this and then rolling it around the microphone element 
And then once you've kind of rolled that around here, you can take that and sandwich that between two pieces of fabric or between fabric and skin, and it works really, really well. Coming up in the next lesson, you're going to learn about another microphone alternative called pencil condensers. So check that out coming up next. The pencil condenser can be just what's needed when a shotgun microphone or a lavalier microphone won't work. They are simple to use and they don't cost a fortune. The term pencil mic or pencil condenser is usually used to describe a class of small diaphragm condenser microphones that are used for acoustic instruments such as acoustic guitar, drum overheads, small percussion, and they all share the same general shape. They're all relatively short in comparison to a big shotgun microphone. They're cylindrical and sort of narrow. So why are these useful for video production? Well, two main reasons. They are small and their pattern or their polar pattern is wider than your standard shotgun microphone. This means that they can be used indoors where shotgun microphones may present a problem. Like you learned earlier, a shotgun microphone often will have a pickup sensitivity in the rear of the microphone. And in some situations, this can create a really strange phasing effect where you have the sound arriving at the microphone from the sound source in the front of the microphone, and then you have the same sound being reflected off of the ceiling, or sometimes off the walls in the ceiling, and then being picked up by the rear of the microphone. And this can be problematic because those two sounds will arrive at different times, and that can cause some phase cancellation, which sounds weird. Also, shotgun microphones are large, so if you are in an interior and you have, say, a shotgun microphone that's a foot or longer, getting it up high enough if you have people who are standing can be problematic because there just might not be enough room above their heads. So that's where these small condenser microphones or pencil condensers can come in really handy. They're basically used exactly how you would use a shotgun microphone. Most often they're put on a boom with some kind of shock mount and you boom them over the talent or the person speaking and point them in the general direction of their mouth. Because these types of microphones have a wider pattern, you have a little bit of wiggle room in terms of where the person is positioned. So you don't always have to have it kind of laser focused right on the person's mouth. If it's kind of pointed in that general direction and it's pretty close, you can get really great results. Now because of their physical size, you won't find one of these types of microphones labeled as a shotgun pickup pattern, but you will find them in cardioid, supercardioid, and hypercardioid. And the super and the hypercardioid can be really great for getting that tighter directionality on the microphone while still giving you a little bit wider of a pickup pattern compared to a shotgun microphone. One of the great things about these pencil condensers is that you can find really high quality microphones with great performance fairly inexpensively. That's not to say that all pencil condenser microphones are inexpensive because they're not, but you can find some really great ones for not much money. For example, you can find microphones like the Samson CO2 pencil condenser, and that you get a pair of microphones for around $100 USD. And the performance on those microphones is really pretty good. And in fact, this microphone here is a, a pretty old MXL 991, and it sounds fantastic. So here's a quick example of a shotgun microphone versus this little pencil condenser microphone here. Now, I already have the shotgun microphone rigged. It's right above my head. It's actually just out of frame, just a little bit you can see right there. So it's about as close as I can get it. And so at this distance, it should sound pretty good, but let's compare that to this cardioid pencil condenser microphone. So I just swapped out microphones. I didn't reposition anything, I didn't adjust any gain, so you're now hearing what this MXL 991 small diaphragm pencil condenser microphone sounds like. Now because of the physical size of the microphone, it is further away than this shotgun microphone, which extended down a good bit further, and I can also, because it's further away, I mean right now it's, it's probably eight inches above where the end of the shotgun microphone is, and because it's shorter, I can actually get it a little bit closer, so I'm going to adjust the stand and give you another demonstration. All right, so now that pencil condenser microphone is just off frame. In fact, I can probably pull it, yeah, see, it's right there. There's no wind muff on it, so I can get it basically as tight as I can get it here, so you can hear the difference. 
But you should hear that compared to where it was before, this is a lot tighter. I can see from my meters on my monitor there that I am getting more signal. And so because it's closer, I know without even listening to it that it sounds better, more signal to noise ratio because it's closer to the source, which means more signal here in less kind of room reverberation. Does it sound as good as this microphone right here? But probably not because it's not quite as directional. But keep in mind that this is a cardioid pickup pattern. If you had just one of these to record two people, it would do a heck of a lot better than this microphone here because this microphone, when you get off axis from it, you start to lose a lot of high frequency information. This microphone, if I just move over a little bit, is not going to sound drastically different. It may sound a little bit different as I'm kind of varying the distance here, but that should be just in level. This has a nice, pretty wide pickup pattern here because it's a cardioid. Supercardioids and hypercardioid little pencil condensers are going to be a lot closer to the directionality of a shotgun. Not quite as directional, but they're gonna be a lot tighter than this. So you have some options there and all of these are really inexpensive. So this microphone rigged up on a boom pole pretty close to your subjects. Like if I had two people pretty close here, I could probably get pretty good results using just one microphone. Would two shotgun microphones be better? Probably. Would two labs be better? Yeah, probably. But if you only had room for one microphone, this would probably be the microphone that you would want to go with. Now, like I mentioned before, you can find these microphones in a cardioid, supercardioid, and hypercardioid pickup pattern. However, it's my experience that if you're looking for a hypercardioid pencil condenser, those microphones with that pickup pattern tend to be a good bit more expensive than microphones that have a supercardioid and cardioid pickup pattern. A lot of the hypercardioid pencil condensers out there are right around four to $500 USD. Now compare that to supercardioid or hypercardioid, where you can find a lot of great sounding microphones for $150, $100 USD, and even less. Another cool thing about these microphones is that accessories can be pretty inexpensive for them as well. Like I mentioned before, this shock mount I got for my shotgun microphone, and it was pretty inexpensive, less than $15 USD on amazon.com. And I picked up this little gem right here for just $16 on Amazon. This is a really fantastic wind muff. It's got some really nice open cell foam on the inside, and it's got this nice rubber gasket to protect from wind entering and affecting the capsule from the rear of the wind muff. And for a little setup like this, you're talking $16 for the wind muff, $15 for the shock mount, and potentially less than $100 for a nice super cardioid microphone, or even in the case of the Samson CO2, two microphones for less than $100. And that's a really fantastic sounding little setup there that'll work outside even with relatively moderate winds. So the pencil condenser is a great tool to have in your arsenal. It doesn't cost a fortune and they sound fantastic. Coming up in the next lesson, you're gonna learn about the last microphone that's really useful for video production and that's handheld microphones. So check that out coming up next. When you are at a loud event or conference, doing a man on the street interview or delivering news, a handheld microphone is often the best choice. And in this lesson, you'll find out why. Handheld microphones are very simple devices. The vast majority of these that are used for video production are dynamic microphones. There's a small movable coil that sits within the field of a permanent magnet. That coil is attached to a very thin diaphragm. When the diaphragm vibrates from sound, that moves the coil within the field of the permanent magnet, and that creates a very small electrical current. It's exactly the same way a loudspeaker works, only in reverse. In fact, you can use a loudspeaker as a microphone, although it won't work very well for that purpose. Because dynamics are so simple, they are extremely rugged, they're resistant to physical shocks, moisture, and they have incredible off-access rejection, which is a real benefit when you're using them at a live event. The other thing that's great about these microphones is that you hold them really close to your mouth. You are your own boom operator in this respect. Even if you're doing kind of a man on the street interview and holding it out for another person, you generally get it pretty close to their mouth, so it does a great job at getting a really good signal. A lot of the handheld microphones that you will see used at conferences, at live events, on the news, are omnidirectional microphones. 
The big benefit of using an omnidirectional handheld microphone is that you don't have to be critical in how the microphone is oriented. So you can hold the microphone like this, and it sounds pretty much the same as if you were to point it more directly at your mouth. The other thing is that an omnidirectional microphone doesn't exhibit proximity effect, like you learned earlier in this course. And that can be pretty important if you're doing a man on the street interview and you are holding the microphone out for somebody and then bringing it back really close to your mouth. If you're holding it out for someone over here and they're like a foot away and then you bring it back to your own mouth and you're like three inches away, a lot more bass response here, a lot less bass response here. Is that a huge deal? Not really, but it is more convenient if you're using an omnidirectional microphone. You'll also see that the microphones that are typically used for those man on the street or conference type situations or even on the news are quite long. That way you don't have to have your hand so close to your mouth. You can have your hand kind of down in this region and the microphone kind of extends up here. And there's microphones that are made specifically for that. You can find microphones from Rode, Audio-Technica, and others that are a good bit longer than your average handheld microphone and work really great in those situations. Now you may have noticed that the microphone that I've been holding up the whole time is not one of those longer reporter-style microphones. That's because I have never really needed one of those microphones in my own production. This is, however, a really fantastic handheld microphone. This is a Shure Beta 57A. And it's not an omnidirectional microphone. In fact, this is a supercardioid microphone. Now, why would you want a more directional microphone to use in a live environment when you are doing man on the street, when you are in a loud event, if you're at a conference, if you're doing the news? The primary reason is that off-axis rejection, like I mentioned earlier. If you are in a super noisy environment, an omnidirectional microphone is probably not the best choice because it's not going to be doing any off-axis rejection. It's going to be getting sound from all directions. Where this microphone, if you point it right at your mouth, is going to do a lot of off-axis rejection. So you're going to get, that's right, a higher signal-to-noise ratio. So if you're at a loud event, a conference, really anywhere that it's loud, and you want more signal-to-noise ratio, using a directional microphone is probably a better bet. This is just a quick demonstration to show you the difference between an omnidirectional microphone and a unidirectional microphone in a loud environment. I'm playing kind of ambient crowd noise here through speakers in the studio space, and it is loud. It's probably upwards of 90 decibels. I can barely hear the sound of my own voice. In fact, you can probably hear me strain to speak. But I want to show you the difference between an Omni and a unidirectional. This is the Shure Beta 57A Super Cardioid. Over here, this is a Behringer ECM 8000 measurement microphone. This is a condenser microphone, so it's not meant to be handheld. In fact, that's why I have it in this shock mount here to isolate it from the movements of my hand. But an Omni is an Omni, and although the frequency response will be different, the pickup pattern is going to be essentially the same with an Omni handheld. Like I mentioned before, I don't have an Omni handheld, but this should give you a pretty good idea between how these two microphones or two pickup patterns will work in a loud environment. Again, this is an Omni, so if I spin this around here, you can see that there's not going to be any real change to the sound of my voice or the ambient noise. However, with this microphone, if I turn this microphone around and keep speaking into it, you should hear my voice drop off pretty dramatically here, right? Try and talk into the back of the microphone, and it should be, yeah, that's a lot less. I can tell from the meter, so this microphone, you can hear a big difference. So. Again, this is just a quick demonstration between an Omni and a super cardioid in a super loud environment. Back to you, Dave. And the great thing is that all of these handheld microphones that were great for video production are really inexpensive. All of the most popular handheld Omnis, the reporter style microphones that are a good bit longer, are between one and $200, most of them on the lower end of that spectrum. Even this microphone costs only $140 USD, which in the grand scheme of handheld microphones is really not that much. But if you're looking for more of a value, you can definitely find some great performing microphones for less than $100. One thing I want to mention is that a dynamic microphone will not work well with a smaller form factor camera without two things, either an external microphone preamp or a good high quality wireless system. You can get a wireless system with a little cube that attaches directly to the XLR connector of a handheld microphone and turns it into a wireless microphone. 
The reason why you need a good wireless system to make that work is that dynamic microphones have very little output. They are not very sensitive at all, which means that you need more preamp gain to be able to turn the output of the microphone up to make it usable. So you're going to need a wireless system with one of those little cubes that has pretty good performance if you want to use one of these microphones. Most of the wireless transmitters around the $400 to $500 range can do the job just fine. Another option in wireless microphones is to just get a self-contained wireless handheld unit. This won't offer the same flexibility as a separate microphone and small XLR transmitter, but it's going to be a less expensive option. Just be aware that almost all of these handheld wireless systems are unidirectional, so they'll be cardioid, if not super cardioid, microphone patterns, and that's not necessarily a problem, it's just something to be aware of. You can find some fairly inexpensive XLR microphone preamps with phantom power that work for smaller form factor cameras, but you really need one with great preamp performance, and that's gonna cost probably in the three to $400 range. So you do have options. You can make it work with a smaller form factor camera with one of these dynamic handheld microphones, but it's gonna cost a little bit of money. If you have a camera with XLR inputs, using a dynamic microphone will probably be fine. You'll have to turn up your preamps probably a lot more than you will using a shotgun microphone or even a lavalier microphone, but most of the cameras that I've seen have plenty of gain to be able to use a handheld microphone and have it sound just fine. So now that you know why handheld microphones can be such a lifesaver in a loud or noisy environment, you're ready to move on to the next lesson in this course, where you're going to learn about cases and accessories. Understanding how microphones work and how to choose a microphone for a particular situation is important, but don't forget about how to transport them safely. In this lesson, you'll learn about cases and how to transport audio gear and what accessories you might want to have with you on a shoe. Transporting audio gear doesn't have to be complicated. If you have a small kit, maybe a single wireless system or one shotgun microphone, you can probably get away with transporting it in your camera case if your camera case is big enough. As your audio kit grows, it might be time to think about a dedicated case to store all your microphones, cables, and accessories. Now, the thing that's going to dictate what kind of case you're going to need is where you're going to be shooting, the types of travel that's going to be involved. Are you going to be flying? Are you going to be riding on the back of a camel or a horse? These sorts of things need to be considered when choosing a case. If you're going to be off in remote locations, if you're going to be out in the elements, dust, wind, weather, snow, you're probably going to want to get a hard case for your camera and your audio gear as well. Those types of cases, especially from Pelican, can take a ton of abuse and have been time tested. They're a great option, but they do cost a pretty penny. What works for me is something far more simple. I use a Pelican case for my main camera gear, but for my audio gear, because I'm not toting it around in the Sahara and in Siberia, I use one of my old camera cases. This is a soft backpack style camera case, and this works really well for me because I'm not really hard on my gear. All of the audio gear that I put in here is fairly light, so it doesn't put a lot of stress on the bag, and it has ample padding in order to protect the gear. I also like these photo style cases because they have a lot of adjustable compartments with little Velcro containers that you can make to fit your audio gear really snugly. That's one of the keys to getting a good case solution is to make sure everything has a place and it's not kind of sliding around in a big sack. As things start to move around, they'll start to bump into each other and that's when damage can occur. So it's good to have everything in its, its own little padded container. A lot of times I'll use the bags that microphones came in when they were purchased. They, a lot of microphones will come in like a nice little leather or faux leather little sack. That's a nice extra layer of protection. You can put the microphone right in there and then put that in a bag and that protects the microphone from dust and probably a little bit of moisture. But these sorts of bags, I think, are really great for audio gear. And another great benefit is they're super inexpensive. I think when I bought this bag maybe eight years ago, it was around $40. And you can always find deals on these. They're always on sale. And you don't have to get a really high-end bag to get really good protection. Like I said, these compartments make it really handy to store things and keep everything in their place. I have a little area here where I put my wireless microphones. I have the center section here. I have my shotgun microphone. This is a pretty big thing, so uh, you know, a small little bag is not going to fit this properly. When I 
carry this around, I usually put the windscreen on to give it a little bit of extra protection, and then I put it right in the center kind of divider here. This is, on a photo bag, this is usually where you would put a big giant telephoto lens. There's little sacks up here where I have extra cables and lavalier accessories. I have uh, one of my condenser microphones in here, some mic clips, some extra rubber bands for my shock mount, power supplies, an external recorder sometimes goes with me. I also like to throw a couple of XLR cables in the bag as well so that my audio kit is kind of full and complete. I usually will put maybe like a 20 foot cable and a 15 foot cable or maybe a 35 and, and a 20 up in here. I also like to have in my bag a set of basic gloves. These are a really inexpensive set of knit gloves that have been dipped in some kind of sticky rubbery stuff here. I like these because they give my hands just a little bit of protection. They're not a heavy duty leather glove that you would use to rig lights, but they do offer a little bit of protection. They also have this nice sticky kind of rubbery coating. It's not like an adhesive, but it gives me a little bit more grip and these keep my hands nice and clean. Now, I think that's especially important if you are a solo producer because you're gonna be setting up all of your gear. You're gonna be setting up the lights, the audio, your camera. You don't want dirty hands when you go back to your camera and start touching your buttons. Cameras are sensitive electronics. You have you know, probably some expensive lenses and it's generally not a good idea to get dirt on your camera, on your glass. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but when you can avoid it, I think you should. Now, for me, I'm a little bit crazy about my gear. When I get home from a shoot, if my cables were on the ground in a dirty location, I'll wash my cables with a damp rag. I grip it around the cable and I pull it through to make sure all my cables are super clean for the next time. I'm not saying you have to do that, but I like to have all my gear clean at all times. And having gloves on a shoot can really help with that. Now, you don't have to go out and buy a case. If you are a little bit crafty, if you are of the DIY mindset, you can DIY a case. And that's exactly what I did with this case, which is what I used a few years ago. This is an old wireless microphone case that was just laying around. It's super old. I took out the foam in the bottom and then I replaced that with my own foam and I cut out exact shapes for different pieces of audio gear. A little space for batteries, a little space for an external recorder, a microphone, a shotgun microphone, wireless receiver, wireless transmitter. I hot glued it in the case and it's got a little layer of foam underneath. And so this worked out really well. It's a nice hard case and it cost me almost nothing to put together. If you wanna just go straight and buy a case, that's totally fine too. Whatever you do, a case is important for protecting your microphones, especially as you get into nicer microphones. You know, one of those microphones in that case was pretty close to $470. You get some accessories in there and now you have a bag that's got maybe 1,500 or 2,000 bucks worth of stuff in it. You wanna protect it. This is a little thread adapter. It's used to adapt a 3 8 inch coarse threading that you'll find on a lot of microphone stands and a lot of tripod stands and even some boom poles. And on the outside, it has your standard microphone clip threading, which is five eighths. So this is really handy to have. I like to keep an extra one of these in my parts bag when I go on shoots, because if for whatever reason, the one that's on the end of my boom pole gets lost or damaged, I have a backup. And I can take this thread adapter and I can put it on a tripod if I need to. This is another super inexpensive little accessory that can be handy to have and get you out of a jam. This is an interesting little gadget. The idea is you thread this to a microphone stand or a boom stand. Imagine you had a shoot where you had to record more than one person, but you only had one boom pole and you needed to get two microphones on the end of it. This would be a great option. This is just a basic two to one adapter. In fact, you could get a third microphone on here, but you really wouldn't want to uh, for recording purposes. This works really well with more directional microphones, supercardioids, hypercardioids, shotgun microphones. You can get it to work with two cardioid microphones, but I would recommend that you point them a good bit away from each other, almost at 90 degrees or pretty close to it. Like I mentioned before, it's always good to have an XLR cable. And speaking of cables, tape is always good to have on hand for shoots. Just basic gaff tape, or this is actually industry tape, which is kind of like high-tech gaff tape. It uses a different adhesive than your standard pro gaff gaff tape or whatever brand of gaff tape that you use. And it tends to release a lot cleaner and it doesn't 
leave the stickum on stuff, which is a particular annoyance to me. So some basic gaff tape, please do not use duct tape on your gear. It is not the same as gaff tape. I know it's less expensive than gaff tape and it looks very similar, but it's not the same. And it will leave adhesive on your kit. And that is bad, bad news. Double-sided tape is handy to have for rigging lavalier microphones, but it's also just a real handy tool to have around. This is tunnel tape. This has adhesive around the edges and in the middle there is no adhesive. And this is kind of the same material here as gaff tape. It's kind of this cloth material, so it rips really cleanly. This is really great if you're running cables across where people are going to be walking. You can put some of this, it's very visible with this kind of white and gray striping action on here. And it really prevents tripping hazards, which is not something that you want. These skinny rolls of tape are called spike tape, and they work really great to spike a location or just put a little marker where you need your person to stand. And that way, it's really convenient so you don't have to constantly be checking focus, and you can focus on making sure things look and sound great. It's great for marking locations, and you can find tons of little uses for this, so a roll of spike tape is also really handy to have. And last but not least, one of my most favorite prized accessories is my multi-tool. And when I say multi-tool, I mean the Leatherman Wave. To me, this is the pinnacle of multi-tools. Really any multi-tool that has some basic functionality, a knife, a little tiny screwdriver, maybe a small set of pliers is good to have. So now that you're up to speed with cases and accessories, you're ready to learn about setting levels on your camera. And that's coming up next. In this lesson, you will learn how to set levels on your camera to make sure you're getting enough signal without clipping. You'll also learn what to do with the extra microphone channel if you have one. First, I wanna walk you through how to set levels on a smaller form factor camera. This again is my Canon 7D. And if I jump to the menu here, I have an option to set my levels here, my recording level. Right now it's set to manual and that's what I want. Auto is terrible. If I pop down here to recording level, you can see I can use this dial here to adjust the recording level. Now what that is doing is turning up and down the microphone preamp on the camera. Now, like I said before, these smaller form factor cameras do not have high performance microphone preamps. There are some with better preamps and there are some with worse preamps. This particular camera, does not have very good preamps in it. So what I did with this camera to find out exactly how these preamps performed is I set up a little test for myself. I shot a little piece of paper with some marks on it and every clip I increased the recording level one, well, click as I call it because this dial here makes a click and there are basically 48 levels that you can set on this recording level for this particular camera. I didn't actually record all 48 of them because in my view, that's pretty pointless because I know these cameras and when they get up around half, they become completely useless. So I knew that as long as I got pretty close to half, I'd be fine. And as it turns out, that was actually pretty optimistic because this camera only really performs reasonably well 10 clicks above zero in that range. Past that, things start to become more noisy than I would like it. Now, your own personal tolerance for noise levels, well, that's up to you. Sometimes you need to record a little bit more because you have to get a good signal. If the noise is above negative 50 decibels in the meters in my editing program, then I consider that relatively problematic. I can denoise it. In fact, I can denoise a heck of a lot more noise than that. But if I don't have to, well, that saves me a lot of work. So. Let's start at setting the levels. What are the ideal levels? You can see there's a 12 here, and that's actually negative 12 because it goes from zero to negative. And negative 12 is probably a pretty good place to shoot for. If I talk just a little louder, negative 12 is right where it starts to get into the yellow here. So that's kind of the caution area, if you will. If I really lay on it, you'll see I'll get all the way up to red. And red is bad. Red means clipping. And so the idea here with setting levels is you want to get a nice juicy signal, a lot of signal here before the noise, which is going to live well, way down here off the meter actually. But at the same time, you do not want to get all the way up here to zero because zero means clipping and that is bad. 
Clipping is when the wave is actually chopped off at the top and the bottom. Some clipped signals can be recovered. So light clipping may be recoverable depending on the frequency content and what other sounds are going on, that sort of thing. But you don't want to record a clipped signal. So that's what we want to try and avoid. And so these signals right here would probably work with this particular microphone in the way that I have it set up. If I needed to increase the gain, you can see if I go to set levels here, right now, I just click that over to zero. So right now, the preamp is essentially off. It's not gonna record anything. And one click above zero, this is the least noise that I'm gonna get out of this camera system. Anywhere I go up from here, I'm going to be introducing more and more noise. Now, that's how all preamps work. If you turn them down almost all the way, they're going to be the best in terms of their noise performance. On this particular one, I can really only go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. That right there is about the highest that I feel comfortable with on this particular camera because that is when I can start to hear noise. That's when noise gets above negative 60 decibels in the recording. If it was the case that I couldn't get enough signal, and in this case I can, in fact the signal works fine at one click above zero, but if I couldn't get enough signal for this particular microphone with this wireless unit, and I am using a wireless unit, then there are a couple of more things that I can try to get more signal before I turn the gain up here. On my wireless unit here, the one thing that I wanna make sure is that I have the output set up right and I'm not attenuating the signal before it gets to this camera. Now sometimes you do need to attenuate the signal because the camera is particularly sensitive and you do need to attenuate it. But in this particular case, I don't want it attenuated. Right here you can see, it's almost impossible to see, but there's an ATT that stands for attenuation and I have a negative 20, negative 10, and a zero. Right now it's set to the zero position, which is what I want. I don't want to turn the signal down because that means I'd have to turn the preamp up on my camera and that would give me more noise. That would be a bad thing. We wanna make sure that we're feeding the camera with a good juicy signal so that we don't have to stress the preamp. Also over here, I have another switch to set this to dual mono or balanced. And right now I'm taking a dual mono unbalanced cable and going into my camera. So that is all set up properly. Now, if that didn't work, the other option is to increase the gain on my transmitter. This is my wireless transmitter that I have connected right now. And there is a level here. This is the microphone preamp for this transmitter. There's a mic pre here and there's a mic pre in the camera. So what I can do if I need more signal is I can adjust this microphone preamp here and turn it up a little bit. If you have to crank it all the way up, if you have to turn it all the way up to high, you gotta do what you gotta do. But just know that on some of these transmitters, pushing this up to high, you will start to get noise that creeps in from the transmitter. And so that's gonna be an extra level of noise that you have to deal with. But the idea here is to try and balance this so that you get a nice juicy signal here that's feeding your camera enough signal so that you don't have to stress out the preamp in your camera system on these small form factor cameras. The other thing that you wanna watch out for on the transmitter mic pre is that you don't turn it up so high that you are peaking here at the receiver. So it's possible that you can overload the transmitter and the receiver signal, and that will cause clipping in this system. And that would be bad because then over here it would look like, oh great, we have good looking levels, but they would actually be clipped and they would sound nasty. Now, if you were monitoring that, you would hear that, which is why it's important to monitor your audio. So what about setting levels for a camera with XLR inputs? Well, that's what you're looking at right here. And basically it works the same way. If you're working with just a shotgun microphone, then you just have to set the levels to where they would be appropriate, which is again gonna be around this kind of negative 10 region right about here. Now where I have this microphone set right now is a little bit hot. So what I would do is turn the preamps down just a little bit so that my peaks weren't coming so close to zero. So I made a small adjustment there, and now these are a little bit more in the neighborhood of what I like to see. Now on this camera, I'm using the same wireless unit that I was on the DSLR, except now I've switched that switch on the side to balanced, and I'm going into only one of the channels on this camera with an XLR. However, this camera has a feature in the menu where I can set both channels to channel one, and that's sometimes helpful if you're recording just one lavalier and you don't need any ambient 
sound whatsoever. Now, if I did want some ambient sound, or if this was an interview, and I was behind the camera and I wanted to record what I was saying, what I would do is I would just leave this in the default setup, which is what you're seeing now, where I plug the main microphone, the microphone on my presenter or interviewee on channel one, and then on the camera, I would set the second channel to one of the onboard microphones, or I would set up another little microphone here so that I could hear what I'm saying behind the camera. Because if I'm like 10 or 15 feet away from the interviewee, it can be difficult to hear the questions that I'm asking. Or if I wanted to get ambient sound, I would want a little bit of that on the second channel. It's just a switch on this particular camera from internal to external. When I switch it to internal, it uses the onboard condenser microphone, the right or left one, depending on which channel was switched. And I can set the gain manually, or I can set it to automatic. If I just want to make sure that it always has a nice consistent level, I would set that to automatic. And you can see now I'm getting two different levels slightly because I set the second channel to the onboard mic of the camera. If I was recording with two separate microphones, setting levels would be exactly the same as it would be for one microphone. You just make sure that you have the inputs routed appropriately and you set the level on each microphone individually. Coming up in the next lesson, you're gonna learn about auto gain and limiting and find out whether you should use either one. In this lesson, you are going to learn about auto gain control and limiting and see if there's any benefit to using either one. Auto gain control, sometimes abbreviated as AGC, is a closed feedback system designed to maintain consistent output levels. The exact formula can vary from manufacturer to manufacturer and from camera to camera. Some auto gain circuitry is more aggressive and some is a little bit more conservative. A lot of them work by slowly increasing the input signal until the input signal gets above a certain threshold. Once it passes that threshold, the input is turned down very quickly to maintain a consistent level and avoid clipping. Some auto gain systems can actually work reasonably well and sound pretty transparent. But in my experience, it's never better than you setting the levels properly. The only times when it works to use auto gain control is when you can't focus on the audio, but you need to have it. For example, if you are moving around in a fast paced environment with no time to set up and you need to get audio, you can't monitor it and you can't adjust it on the fly. Without auto gain control, you run the risk of the audio being far too low or so hot that it's clipping. If the camera is on your shoulder and you're moving around really quickly, and rolling, you can't really fix it on the fly. So in those types of situations, auto gain control can work. Another situation where I found that auto gain control is useful is when I have an extra channel that I don't necessarily need, but it would be nice to capture. For example, if I'm shooting an interview and it's just one person and I only have one microphone that I need to record them, I will have an extra channel on my camera. So a lot of times what I'll do is take the second channel and switch that over to the internal microphone and set that to auto gain. That way, I have an extra channel that's recording the room. It'll capture anything that anyone says, including myself, and that can be helpful in post-production to hear what I'm saying and what I said to the interviewee. So here's a quick demonstration of my Canon 7D with the manual level setting and the auto gain. Right now it's set to manual and you can see I'm getting reasonable levels and like you saw before, I do have a little bit of range if I wanted to push this up just a little bit, but I think more or less this is fine. This is probably a little bit less than you saw before because I've adjusted my pack, the transmitter, and I've turned down the gain there. But for all intents and purposes, it's you know within a few decibels of where I had it before. I'm going to record a clip. I'll switch over to the Magic Lantern view here so you can see the audio levels. And this is what it sounds like with manual audio levels. I'm going to stop this recording. I'm going to jump back into the sound recording setup here, and I'm just going to change this to auto. Now watch on the meters as nothing else changes. Now it's an automatic. Holy cow, what is going on? For whatever reason, this automatic gain thinks it should be loud all the time. You can see that even when I'm not speaking, the noise floor is way up there, which is crazy unacceptable. This is kind of like an emergency situation sort of thing. It doesn't look like it's gonna clip, so it looks like it's doing a nice amount of gain increase here and then a hard limiter on the top. It's possible 
that reducing the output of my receiver might help this. So let me attenuate the receiver by 10 decibels. So now I've switched it over and it's attenuating the signal negative 10. And it doesn't seem to have made any difference whatsoever. Let me try negative 20. So that's negative 20. <laughs> And again, it looks like we're hitting zero decibels. This can't possibly sound fantastic. I'm gonna roll a little bit here and you can hear exactly what it sounds like. So again, this is auto gain control engaged on the Canon 7D. Negative 20 decibels of attenuation from the receiver. This is almost certainly going to be more noisy, I would think, than less attenuation. But just so you have an idea, I'm gonna change that. So now it's negative 20 and I'm gonna kick it up so now it's negative 10 and the levels look to be about the same overall. I do have to use Magic Lantern to monitor this because there's no way to monitor the audio uh, with the stock firmware of this Canon 7D. So this is negative 10 decibels of attenuation on the uh, receiver here of my wireless unit and it does look like I can still clip it or that's what it looks like we'll have to hear to know for sure. And this is zero decibels of attenuation. So it looks like we might be just kissing the limiters or just barely clipping. Either way, this cannot be as good as manual level setting on this camera. Just going by the meters alone, this looks like a mess. Far too hot. The noise floor is really, I would say, <laughs> incredibly problematic. And that's without even listening to it. I'm sure you're hearing something that sounds like a complete mess. So in this particular case, yeah, emergency levels only. So now you're looking at the back of my Canon C100, and I just wanna show you the difference between manual and automatic gain on this camera. Like I said before, different cameras will have a different kind of method of automatic gain control, and this camera definitely is different than that Canon 7D. So right now I set the levels to manual and I'll just record for a minute. You can see that there's only one channel being lit up right now. And that's because I don't have this set to record just the channel one microphone on both channels. So now I'm gonna switch it over to automatic gain control and let's see how that is different. Initially here, it looks like this could be problematic because it's super loud. It looks very similar to how it was on the other camera. But what I wanna do is see if attenuating the signal helps at all. All right, so that should be 10 decibels of attenuation. And already things look better, although I'm still hitting that clip limiter there. Let's try negative 20. So this is negative 20, and this actually looks right. Now it's possible that this is going to be perhaps a noisier recording than how I had it before because now I'm attenuating the signal from the receiver by 20 decibels. It's turned down 20 decibels and that's quite a lot. But you can see my levels on the meter are actually louder than they were when I had it set up for manual control. And so if I'm feeding this less signal and I'm getting more signal here, it must mean that the preamps are turned up louder. So on this particular camera, auto gain control does work a heck of a lot better than my other camera, but still it's not going to be as ideal as setting the levels manually. So what about limiting? Limiting is a form of audio dynamic range compression. When the audio signal rises above a certain threshold, the limiter will reduce the gain by a predetermined ratio. This is exactly how an audio compressor works, but with an audio compressor, the range of gain reduction is much more broad. For example, on a regular audio compressor, you might see a gain reduction ratio from 1.1 to 1 up to maybe 10 to 1. If the ratio was set to something like 2 to 1 and the input signal rose above the threshold by let's say 4 decibels, the compressor would apply a gain reduction so that that change was actually only 2 decibels. With a limiter, the ratios can start at 10 to 1 and go all the way up to infinity to 1. The limiter's job is to prevent clipping, so it has to be able to reduce the gain a lot. So as long as the limiter is not increasing the gain, I would recommend that you turn it on. You'll want to experiment with it, of course, to make sure that it sounds good. The idea is that you shouldn't really be hitting the limiter, but if you do, it needs to sound somewhat natural. If it doesn't sound natural, if it sounds a little bit fuzzy, a little bit crispy, weird, and like someone just smashed the volume knob down, 
you might want to leave it off and then back down your levels a little bit. If you set your levels properly, you should have something like 10 to 12 decibels at least of headroom above your nominal signal peaks. And that means you should have more than enough room to prevent you from hitting the limiter. If you run out of headroom, a limiter's job is to prevent the signal from clipping. So I'll just show you on this camera what it sounds like. So now the limiter's off, and the gain is set a little bit high, so I should be able to get this microphone loud enough so where it clips pretty good. Now, how much that actually clipped, I'm not exactly sure, but it almost certainly did clip. Now let's hear the difference between that and when I kick the limiter back on. All right, so now the limiter is on, and it looks like it's just kissing the zero decibel mark, but it's probably not clipped. Same volume coming out of my mouth. It's my Chris Tucker impression. Now that you understand auto gain control and limiting, it's time to talk about monitoring your audio in the field, and that's coming up next. When you're recording and using a microphone to capture high quality audio, monitoring that audio is a must. In this lesson, you will learn how to set up monitoring and what to use to listen to your audio. First, let's talk about how to set up for monitoring. Now, if you're using a camera with XLR inputs, it's almost a certainty that you're going to have a headphone output. So what you're gonna do is take your headphones and plug them in to the headphone output. It's pretty easy. For those of you who are using a smaller camera system, headphone monitoring can be a little bit of an issue because not all cameras that have a microphone input also have headphone outputs. This is a good example. This is a Canon 7D, what some may call an antique. This has a microphone input, so I can get great audio into the camera. However, there's no way to monitor it straight from the camera without some external devices. The first option is to see if your camera has any kind of analog output. This camera does. It has what they call an AV output, audio video. It's standard definition on a composite cable and then a right and left analog output. I can take that analog audio output and I can attach that to a very inexpensive headphone amp and now I have headphone monitoring. And you can find a basic headphone amplifier, one that runs on a battery, for as little as $20 or $30. So that is a reasonable solution. If that didn't work, if your camera is of the current generation and it doesn't have an analog output or you've never heard of analog before, and that's possible, you might be able to get a workaround with the HDMI output. HDMI will often send audio with the video and live audio that's coming into the camera. So that's another option as well. If that will work for you, if you have a camera that has HDMI output and will send the audio live as it's coming into the camera back out over the HDMI cable, you can hook that up to a monitor and hopefully either get headphone out of the monitor or at least an analog out and then hook that up to an inexpensive headphone amp and now you have headphone monitoring. Now, that can be as simple as hooking it up to a computer monitor with HDMI input because a lot of computer monitors will have a headphone output so that you can listen over headphones and so that can work. But I'm guessing as a solo producer, you don't wanna to be toting around a 22 inch monitor, you want something more portable, maybe battery operated. And you do have options there. You can get a six or seven or even eight inch little LCD monitor with HDMI input and most importantly, headphone output or an analog output. Using an HDMI monitor is a great solution because not only can you get your headphone output and listen to the audio, you can also have a larger monitor to see what's going on with your picture, which is kind of a side benefit. If you don't have an HDMI output, and if you don't have an analog output, which is pretty likely if you don't have an HDMI output, can you still monitor the audio? Maybe. There's one last resort you can turn to, and that's to monitor the microphone before it goes into the camera. Now this is not a great option because you're not hearing kind of the whole picture, so to speak. You're not hearing what's happening to the audio after it hits your microphone preamp. You're not hearing any additional noise that may be happening. You're not hearing any clipping that may be happening. Now, you can probably tell that it's clipping from the audio meters if your camera has audio meters, but it's not really the best way to record. You really wanna hear the audio after it goes through the microphone preamp in the camera. But if you can't make that work, the next best thing is to use something like an external recorder as a microphone preamp and then run your microphone into the external recorder 
and then back out of the external recorder into your camera, and then you can monitor it on the external recorder, or you can get an external microphone preamp. A lot of those will come with headphone monitoring, and so you can monitor the audio after it hits the microphone preamp on either the external recorder or the external microphone preamp. Again, that's not the best way to do it, but if you set your levels properly, you can make that work. So I know with this camera, if I set the gain very, very low on the first one or two notches, and I feed this with a nice juicy audio signal, I can trust that the camera's really not gonna do anything too bad to the audio. So now you have monitoring sorted out, right? XLR cameras, super easy, headphone output. With smaller cameras that don't have headphone output, you have three, maybe four different solutions that you can try and get headphone monitoring. Now let's talk about what to use for monitoring. You probably guessed that you're gonna use headphones to monitor the audio, and you are correct. So here are a few options that I think work really well. One is over-the-ear style headphones. These are closed back, really basic headphones. They're not fantastic sounding, they're inexpensive, but the thing that makes them work is that they are closed back and they create a pretty good seal around the ear. You see, the thing about monitoring in a live environment where there's other noise is that in order to hear what's happening in the headphones, a little bit of noise reduction, and I mean passive noise reduction, where you're kind of just blocking the sound, not doing some active electronic wizardry to make the sound go away electronically. What you wanna do is block out some of the natural kind of ambient noise so that you can focus in on what's happening in the headphones. Open back headphones are not good for monitoring because they not only don't really block very much of the outside world at all, but also the sound bleeds out of the back of these ear cups here. So you can hear pretty well what's happening in the headphones from outside the headphones. And that's bad, because there's a potential for that to bleed back into your recording, and that's not good. So some basic closed back headphones is one option. I prefer headphones that are what's called circumoral, meaning they encapsulate the entire ear. The pad is designed to sit around your ear and not kind of press against your ear. Those types of headphones are called supraoral, and they don't block the noise nearly as well, and I also find them painful to use over time because they're kind of pressing your ear in on your head, and if you are a glasses user like I am, that can be pretty uncomfortable. So I like these because they sit fairly comfortably and they go right around my whole ear. And the best part is, you don't need to drop serious coin to get some decent headphones. These headphones came from monoprice.com, and I think when I purchased them five years ago, they were right around $38 USD. I believe the price has come down a little bit since then. These are kind of my go-to cheap headphones. I own several other pair of headphones from Sennheiser, Audio-Technica, and AKG, and I've used headphones from Sony and Shure as well. I like these, I think they're fine, but those other manufacturers make great headphones as well. So find something that you think sounds good and you think sounds relatively flat. You know, you could look for the headphones that are designed for monitoring on sites like B&H Photo, and you will come up with some great options. Now, in addition to traditional headphones, another option, and the one that I usually go with, is a small set of earbuds. Sometimes I call these IEMs, or in-ear monitors. These have a standard headphone plug on them. So these are not designed to go with a mobile phone because they don't have a tip ring ring sleeve. These are just tip ring sleeve, your basic set of headphones, the type that you would have used back when iPods were a thing. And you can look that up on Wikipedia if you don't know what that is. In particular, I like the earbuds that have either a silicone or a rubber seal so that when you put them in your ear, they make a nice tight seal. And this helps to block out the external noise and really helps you to focus in on what you're hearing. These are made by a company called Skull Candy, and I believe these are the inked model. I bought them in a store for about $8. I know, that seems like these would be garbage. And I'm sure they don't sound as good as something that cost like $100, but I find that these sound really pretty decent. I think they're perfectly adequate for monitoring because they don't have a hyped sound. They do a great job of sealing, especially in my ears, because one of the things about earbuds is that they only really work well if they make a nice tight seal. If there's an air leak, 
then you lose most of the bass response, I would say, below 150 hertz. So you can't really tell what's going on with the bass unless they make a really good seal in your ears. And that comes down to the, the shape of this little device right here and kind of the overall shape of the, the interior speaker here. So you may find that something inexpensive like this works for you, or you might need something from like Shure, Sony, or Westone, or some other high-end maker of an in-ear monitor type earbud. Coming up in the next lesson, you're going to learn about what to listen for and how to focus in on audio in the midst of a chaotic recording session. So check that out coming up next. Trying to get great audio while performing as a one-man band can be a recipe for an anxiety attack. With so much to think about with picture, what do you focus on with sound? Find out in this lesson. When you're behind the camera and you're shooting video of someone and they're speaking, there's a lot of things that you're thinking about. You're looking at the lighting, you're looking at the framing, you're looking at the background, and you're seeing if there's anything back there that can be potentially distracting. When it comes to sound, it can be hard to disconnect what you're seeing from what you're hearing. And I think one thing that can help is to try and do a lot of the problem solving before you start rolling. In my experience, I start listening to the room, to the sound, to the location before I start putting on microphones. So as I'm finishing up setup, what I do is I'll start to mentally become aware of anything that's making noise in the space, an HVAC system, right? Heating or cooling, any fans that are running or circulating air or any appliances on if I'm indoors. If I'm outdoors, is there perhaps a better location close by? Maybe that's that can be blocked off by a building to shield from some noise. There's a lot of those types of things that you start to notice once you become aware of them. You wanna think about ambient noise and how do you reduce that as much as possible so that you can get that all important high signal to noise ratio. Once you have your microphone set up, whether it's a lav, a shotgun, a little condenser, whatever it is, you want to be listening for things through the microphone. You want to try and key your ear in to what the microphone is hearing, because sometimes you'll have noises in the space that the microphone really isn't picking up on. And so you don't really have to stress out about that too much as long as the microphone is not picking those things up. Now, once you have the mics rigged up and in place and, and your speakers or your presenters or the people that you're shooting your talent, so to speak, is in place, whether that's one person or a few people, you want to listen to anything that may be causing noise on your subjects, on your talent. A lot of times, jewelry that doesn't sound like it's going to be an issue in the room is super apparent on a microphone, especially a lavalier microphone. Sometimes necklaces or beaded jewelry is almost inaudible naturally, but once you put a microphone two inches away from it can make a whole heck of a lot of really distracting noise. So that's something that you want to watch out for. Moving the microphone may help that situation, asking the talent to perhaps remove the jewelry if it's going to be a problem. That can help too. I can remember one shoot, I think it was about a year ago, and I was shooting an older gentleman who didn't really have any jewelry on, but he was wearing a blazer with brass or some kind of metallic buttons. And believe it or not, when he moved his arm a certain way, the buttons on the sleeve of his blazer would jangle and they would I would hear this clicking noise. So we did a little tape magic to try and reduce that as much as possible. But those are the types of things that you want to be listening for. There's also other sources of noise that people may be doing subconsciously that you may want to listen for. Things like clothing noise. It's possible someone has, you know, a strange fabric on their pants. And so when they scooch in their chair, it makes a sort of noise. Or, you know, the clothing can be really strange. Different types of fabric, when they rub together, can make some really strange noise. You may have to help coach your talent, you know, okay, I, I need you not to swivel in your chair or move around, you know, try and help that situation as diplomatically as you can. And these things are easier for the people on the other side of the camera to do before you start recording too. Because once you start recording, if the folks on the other side of your camera lens are not kind of seasoned professionals or actors, if they're not experienced being in front of camera, when they know you're recording, things can get weird. People get super nervous. They start doing things that they 
wouldn't normally do. It's, there's this kind of nervous energy. So anything you can do to try and take care of any of these sound issues before you start recording and make your folks comfortable can really help. When I'm setting levels with someone in front of my camera, I'll have them just talk a little bit about themselves, what their family is like, where they live, the kind of car they drive, what they do for work, what the traffic was like that day, to get them just kind of talking a little bit. You know, they can just kind of mindlessly spit that stuff out and they don't really have to put too much thought to it. And then on my end, I'll be listening to the quality of the microphone. Is it placed just right? Is there any kind of weirdness happening with their voice? A lot of times people get nervous. They're mouths get really dry and they can get a little clicky. So sometimes I might suggest that they take a little water or some kind of drink to get the saliva flowing. I might offer them a flavored water and let them know that that helps to lubricate the mouth and get a better sound or lubricate the vocal cords, something to that effect. Kind of a diplomatic way because if you say, your mouth is making weird clicks, that's going to make somebody more nervous. So there's a way you can help someone lubricate their mouth so that you're not getting clicks, that is something that can be beneficial. For me, once I hit the record button, I start to make a mental shift and I am no longer focused on the sound quality issues and my brain starts to move more towards making sure the person in front of the lens is making sense. Again, because in my experience, folks who don't have a lot of experience in front of the lens, it's very possible that they can start jabbering gibberish and the things that they say don't make sense. So my brain, once I hit the record button, shifts more towards trying to help them, to direct them, to coach them to get a good performance, to ask the right questions or to ask them to explain something in such a way that I get something that I know I can cut around. So you want to try and take care of as many of those things before you hit that record button so that you're comfortable with the way it sounds, so that your people on the other side of the lens are as comfortable as possible, and that should lead to some great sounding recordings. Coming up in the last lesson of this course, you're going to get some final tips and tricks to make your on-camera audio sound great. In this lesson, you will get some final tips and tricks to make your on-camera audio sound great. One thing that I like to do is read manuals. Okay, I don't like to read manuals, but I think it's a good idea to do. A lot of times you'll find that the device that you're using, whether it's your camera or your wireless system or a microphone, may have another capability that you didn't know that it had, and you won't find that out until you read the manual. A lot of times it's boring, but it's good to at least have that knowledge under your belt. You don't want to get to a gig and have to solve a problem and not know how to do it that could have been solved just by reading the manual. So read the manual of your wireless systems, your microphones, the microphones, the manual's not too long, and your camera too. Next, pre-test everything. Make sure you work out all of your wiring and you set up your camera so it's in the right mode. You set some basic levels before you get to the gig. This is especially helpful to do when you're working with new gear. You don't want to get a new wireless system and read the manual and say, oh, yep, I got everything set. I know exactly how it works. Get to the gig and then be under pressure to make everything work because your brain doesn't function so well when that happens. So make sure you set everything up, you know how to run through the functions and get the piece of gear to do the thing that you want it to do first. Along those same lines, make sure you know how to work the frequencies and the channels of your wireless units. If possible, when you get to a gig, if your wireless system has this capability, and if it recommends doing so in the manual, scan the frequencies that are available. There are several wireless units that have the ability to scan all the open channels to make sure that it's going to select the best possible channel in the space that you're in. Because what works for home in your nice controlled space may not work when you get to the location and there are other people using devices on these frequencies that you have no idea about. So when you get to the gig, run a frequency scan, run a channel scan, whatever it's called in your particular system. Let the receiver pick the right channel, the optimal frequency for you. Sync your transmitter to it, and you'll have a much better chance of success. Also, talk to your friends and your other colleagues in the production world. And it doesn't actually have to be in video production. It could be your buddy who does sound at the local church or your friend who's in a band. These people have access to music gear and 
microphones and that sort of thing. So pick their brain, find out what microphones they like. You will tend to hear the same sorts of things. Everyone loves the Shure SM58 and so on. But you may find out that your buddy in a band has a pair of Rode NT5s, which are small pencil condensers. And they work great for recording voice on a boom. You see, a lot of the microphones that work great for voice recording also work in live environments, handheld microphones, overhead microphones that you'd put on a drum kit or to record percussion or a hi-hat microphone. These microphones, if you know your buddy has one, you might be able to borrow one or maybe even rent one from your buddy for just a couple of bucks, and that can really help you to expand the capabilities of your audio system just by kind of utilizing the network that you already have in place. Along those same lines, rent the things that you don't need all of the time. It might be nice to have access to a wireless microphone every second of the day, but if you only actually need one four times a year, it's probably more cost effective to rent one from the local rental place or online. Instead of dropping some serious coin into buying one, you can rent one and you may be able to roll that cost into the production as well. So for those more expensive items, wireless microphones, high-end microphones, a high-end mic pre that you might need or a multi-channel recorder, rent when you need them and buy when it's absolutely necessary. Finally, I always want to remind everyone about safety. If you have cables laying on the ground, put some tape on them. If you have stands, they need sandbags. It doesn't matter what microphones sound like or how well you recorded something, if someone trips and falls or gets a nasty head injury while you are running the shoot. So always make sure you are safety conscious. Get that gaff tape, get that tunnel tape, tape stuff down, put the sandbags down, and you'll protect yourself from some real trouble. So that about does it for this course. I hope that you found this interesting, and more importantly, I hope you can take the things that you learned in this course and put them to use to get some great sounding on-camera audio. Thanks so much for watching. My name is Dave Bodie for Envato, and I'll see you around.